Okay, so this is uh, part two of two for creating priority lists. In the first video, we looked at the decreasing time algorithm. And in this video, we're going to look at the critical time algorithm. So as you recall, this slide was in the last presentation, and we had gone over these first two. Um, should we complete tasks in alphabetical order? Should we complete tasks based on how long they take to complete? Those were covered in the last video, part one of two. Um, and in this one, we want to focus on should we complete tasks based on the pre preceding tasks they have. So schedule tasks based on preceding tasks. Uh, as we said in the previous lesson, we talked about the decreasing time algorithm, and we uh, created our priority list by scheduling the tasks that take the most time first, and then continuing in descending order of task time. So now we're saying, what if um, delays are caused by preceding tasks instead of just the longest tasks? So we say, what if we did our scheduling um, instead of on individual ta task time, we based it on combined task times. So the idea behind this is there's a chain reaction if uh, preceding tasks aren't done to get the tasks that have the longest processing time um, to the workers as soon as possible, then when we do get to that task that has a lot of time, it's going to, to delay the project finishing time. So if we look at this graph, um, we want to start this conversation of critical time by looking at something called the critical path. The critical path from any vertex uh, to the end vertex is the path that has the greatest weight. So if we look at this one here, if we look at vertex G, we see that vertex G has two different paths to get to the end vertex. We have this first path up here, and then we have a second path down here. So we want to look at the path that has the most weight. So we're going to find the critical path for, for G, E, and H. And if we look at G, we can go the path from G to D to A to the end vertex. And if we add up all of the numbers there, G has a time of 2, D has a time of 7, A has a time of 2. This path to get to the end would take 11 units of time. And then we noted that G also has a second path. We can go from G, but instead we can head towards vertex E, and then to B, and then to end. And if we added up these times, we would have two units of time for G, five units of time for E, three units of time for B, and that gives us 10. Now, the goal of the critical path and the critical time algorithm is to identify the path with the most weight, because that means the most time to get to the end. And what we're looking for is a chain reaction of events that are going to cause delays in our scheduling. And that's why we're always looking for the biggest number. So the critical path for G is G, D, A, end. And this number 11 is known as the critical time for G. And you're going to see that we're going to start denoting critical time in these graphs by using a square bracket. And the critical time, that means the time of the longest path. So let's look at this now for vertex E. And if we look at vertex E, we see that there's only one path. We go from E to B to end. So there's not much to do here. We just say, all right, the critical path for E is E to B to end. And if we add those up, we see, well, end takes zero time. We can put that end has a critical time of zero. And if we add zero, three, and five, we get a critical time of eight for vertex E. And the last one, 
in this slide is to look at vertex H. H we see has two different paths. I can go from H to E, from E to B, and then from B to end. And if we add up each of these times, H is 1, E is 5, B is 3, and end is 0. So 1 plus 5 is 6, plus 3 is 9, plus 0 is 9. And now we want to consider the other path from H to F, H to F, from F to C, and then from C to end. So we see that there were two different paths that we can take from H to end. And now we want to add up their times. H was 1, F was 3, C was 4, and is 0. 1 plus 3 plus 4 plus 0 is 8. We want the larger number because we're looking for what could possibly delay our project. So H has a critical path of H, E, B, end. And the rest of this, I'm just going to clear out. And we can now put the critical time for H was 9. So that was the longest path. These are the actual paths, what we call critical paths, because these are the paths that take the most time. Once we identify that time, the most time, we put it in square brackets. We call that the critical time. So the critical time for each task is calculated using a backflow algorithm. This gives us an easier way to do this. So I already said that end takes zero time. And now we work our way backwards. We take zero and we add it to two. Zero plus two is two. We take two, we add it to seven. Seven plus two is nine. And this gives us a very easy way to calculate um, critical times. However, I can't go back to G because I see G has two different arcs feeding into it. That means before I can determine what G's critical time is, I need to determine what vertex E critical time is. So let's start back at end. End is 0, add it to the 3 for the B. B has a critical time of 3. Let's continue working backwards. That's why it's called the backflow algorithm. So from 3, if we add the critical time of 3 to 5, we get a critical time of 8. And now we have to make a decision here. For vertex G, are we going to use the 9 or are we going to use the 8? Remember, critical time wants to know what is going to cause the biggest delays. So we choose the 9. 9 plus 2 gives us a critical time of 11. So let's clear all of this out. So now let's continue working with the rest of our vertices. I'm going to take the zero from end and add it to the four on C. That gives us a critical time of four. And now I can take the four from C and add it to the three from F. That gives us a critical time of seven. And when we get to H, we see once again, we have a choice to make. Which critical time are we going to add to H? Well, we have a choice between eight or seven. We always choose the larger because we want to know what is going to be our delay. So we're going to add a critical time of eight to H is one. So H now takes nine units of time. That's the longest path from H to get to the end vertex. Now that we've, I just want to fix this. This is an 11. Now that we have all these critical times, we can say which critical time should we put by the start vertex. That critical time is 11. That's the largest one connected to start. We saw there were two different arcs feeding back into it. And this tells us that this project can never be completed in less than 11 units of time, no matter how many workers we get on it. And that's because of the chain of events that must take place. Um, in past presentations and in classroom lessons, we've talked about the example of building a house. I can't call in the roofers if the foundation isn't done and the house frame isn't up. 
that has to be completed before the roofers can be called in. So there's always going to be a minimum amount of time that has to go by um, for previous steps. And that's the significance of this number. We know that this project can never be completed in less than 11 units of time. So just to recap, the critical time algorithm is a scheduling process that generates a priority list based on the critical times in descending order. We're going to do that next. The critical time is denoted by a set of square brackets on the digraph. For example, if I had a task Z, the parentheses tells me task time. That's how long it takes to complete that individual task. And the square brackets tells me critical time. That is the chain of events from task Z all the way to the end of the project, and that is the longest path from Z to end. So the notation shown above lists a task Z with a processing time of 5 and a critical time of 13. This means that the task Z takes 5 units of time to complete and a minimum of 13 units of time to get to the end of the project. The word minimum is used because... 13 is the best case scenario. That means 13 units of uninterrupted time. However, scheduling projects means juggling and reassigning your workers to obtain the optimal result, which the number of workers on hand. A final note, the critical time for the start vertex is the minimum amount of time in which the project can be completed. If you complete it faster than this, then you likely scheduled a task before one of the precedent tasks were completed, and therefore you have an invalid timeline. So you have to go back and check your work. Let's continue with this example. We've already got the critical times listed in this column, and we want to write the priority list using the critical times. So just like the decreasing time algorithm, the critical time algorithm uses decreasing critical times. So we start with a critical time of 11. That means the first task we want to schedule is G. We have to remember to use the task time of 2 when we put it on the schedule, not 11. 11 is telling us how long it takes to get to the end of the project, and it's telling us to schedule G first, but we must use the task time with G, not the critical time, when we put it on the schedule timeline. Next, after 11 comes 9, but I see I have two instances of 9, so we will follow suit with uh, when we have a tie, we use alphabetical order. So we're going to put task D with its 7 units of task time, followed by task H with its 1 unit of task time. The next critical time is 8, that's task E with 5 units of task time, then we go to 7, task F with 3 units of task time, next after 7 comes 4, so C4, B3, and A2. So that is our priority list. And that is the priority list that was made using critical times. Now, let's create the schedule. So we have our priority list typed out here, and we're going to follow that priority list as we put everything onto the schedule. So just as we've done in the past, we say, can we schedule G2 first? And we say, yes, it's right here connect it to the start vertex, I can schedule it right away. So G takes two units of time. That's done. Next is D. I see I can't do D until G is finished. I'm looking for something to schedule at time zero for the second worker. So I skip over this and look at H. I say, can I schedule H right away? Yes, we can. It's connected to start. That's one unit of time. H is done. Now I go back. I say, at 
time one, I'm looking for something to give worker number two. Can I give them task D? The answer is no, because task D can't start until G is done. G is not done until time two. I cannot start that at time one then. So we're not doing D now. Let's skip over to the next one. Can we do E? E needs both G and H to be completed. Well, at time one, H is completed, but G is not. I cannot do E. I'm going to skip over E. Can we do F? F requires that H be completed. H is completed, so I can schedule F. I'm going to underline it saying that I'm putting it on the schedule. And since it's three units of time, one, two, three, put an F in there. One plus three brings us to four. And now I go back to the beginning of my priority list and I say, can I schedule D now? Well, D has been waiting for G to finish. G is finished at this time, so I can schedule it. D requires seven units of time. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So task D will take up this part of the schedule. Two plus seven brings us to the ninth unit of time. I'm going to underline it saying it's been put on the schedule. Next on my list is E. E is waiting for G to finish. It's finished at this point. I'm looking at hour four or unit of time four, and that's at the end of F. G is completed at that time. The other thing that E is waiting for is H. H was completed way earlier. Since they're both completed, I can schedule E here. E is five units of time. Four plus five brings us to nine. E is scheduled. Now I'm going to look at C next. Both processors finish at the ninth unit of time, so both are available. And I'm going to say, can I schedule C at that time? And C on our digraph is waiting for F. F is done way back at hour four, so yes, I can schedule C. One, two, three, four units of time. 9 plus 4 brings us to 13. I can say that's been scheduled. Now I look at B. B is waiting on E. E is done at the ninth hour. I can schedule that. 1, 2, 3. 9 plus 3 is 12. B has been scheduled. And now A is waiting for D. D was completed back at the ninth um, unit of time. A is 2 units. That so brings us to 13, 14. So this project is finished at the 14th unit of time, and this is one block of idle time. So we can say the finish time is 14, and the idle time is 1. Notice how well everything fit on the schedule. The critical time algorithm takes into account the linked events, and that's why we have this new number. G was the longest event to get to the end, so that's why G was scheduled first. H was the second longest, D was third, and that's why D and H are here. Actually, they were tied both with nine. We had to keep skipping over D until its prerequisites were met, but then we scheduled it as soon as possible, and we got all of the what's called the chain reaction of events scheduled to avoid a lot of time waiting and doing nothing where our processors are at idle. So we see that we got a very efficient schedule here and everything fit nicely. So let's look at this next example. Um, the first one was your guided notes example. This is your first practice example. Pause the video here. See if you can do this on your own. Um, your goal is to find each critical time, fill in the chart, and then write your priority list. Once you've done that, unpause the video, and I'm going to advance to the next slide where all of these answers are already in. So here we are. This is the list of critical times in the table and on the chart. And based on those critical times, the priority list is written out here. And now we're ready to go to the next step. So. You can pause at this point and see if you can finish the timeline below on your own. Um, I found that this timeline is going to require that I 
count each box as two units of time so it'll fit in what's printed out here. And then if each one is two units of time, that means I would use a half for one unit of time. So again, if you want, pause here and try to do the timeline on your own and then unpause it to watch the solution. So based on my uh, priority list, the first task I want to schedule is B. B is eight units of time. I'm using these boxes to count as two each. So it's two, four, six, eight. And I'll put B in there. I'll cross it off the list. Next is D. That also is connected to start. I can schedule that right away. Two units of time. Put D there. Cross it off the list. Next is A. A is 13 units of time. It is only waiting for B to be completed. Um, since B is completed at 8, I cannot schedule A at 2. So I'm going to skip over A for now because my second worker is looking for something to do while worker 1 is still completing task B. So we look at C. C needs B and D to be completed. D is completed, but B is still in process. It won't be done for a while. So we skip over that and look at E. E is waiting for D to be completed. It is done. There's nothing else that E needs, so we can schedule that. It's 15 units of time. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, and a half a box brings us to 15. And 15 units of time plus 2 means that this is the 17th unit of time in the project. And that was task E. I'll cross that off. Now, as always, we go back to the prerequisite tasks to say, can we schedule them? So I'm looking to schedule A, and we see that the worker that is available is worker one at the end of task B. And if we look at this graph, yes, A can be done as soon as B is done. So we're going to take A's 13 units, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 13. 13 plus 8 brings us to 21. There's task A. I'll cross it off. Next on the list is task C. C needs tasks B and D to be done. At the 17th unit of time, B and D are both completed. Uh, B completed at the 8th unit and D at the 2nd. So I can schedule C. It's 11 units of time. I have one unit here. And then 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. 1 plus 10 gives us 11 units. We're at the 28th unit of time in the project. That's task C. I can cross it off. Next in my list is G. G is waiting for C to finish, but worker 1 is ready to go while C is still in process. So I skip over G and I look at F. F is waiting for A to finish. Well, A finishes right here with worker 1. So I can schedule F right away. So those six units of time, 6 plus 21 is 27. So my schedule will bring me out to here with F. And I can't start G until C is done. So this is going to be idle time here. And once C is complete, we can schedule G. G is seven units of time. Two, four, six, seven. Remember, this line is the 28th unit of time. 28 plus 7 is 35. And then that gives us idle time down here for the second worker. So we can say that um, finish time is 35. F for finish time equals 35. And idle time, I have... This small block of time here, which was one unit, and then this large block of time here, which was seven. So that's eight units of idle time. So in this next example, we want to complete the um, project timeline using the decreasing time algorithm first. And then the same project with the critical time algorithm, and we're going to compare the results. So in this first one, 
we want to make the priority list. So we can write that out. All we're looking at with the decreasing time algorithm, and that's what we're using right here. So based on the decreasing time algorithm, we have task B, which is nine units. That's the longest. Then E, which is seven. I'm going to fix my nine, make sure it's legible there. After E, we have G, which is five units. Then D, four units. A, three units. C is three units. And F is two units. So this should fit on the timeline, counting them as one unit per box. Uh, we start by looking at B, and we see that B is out here. It can't be started. It has prerequisite tasks. Next, we look at E, and we see that E is connected to start. I can schedule that right away. This is time 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And task E has been scheduled. We go back and we say, can we do B yet? No, B is waiting on A and D. So we skip B. We've done E already. We look at G. Can I schedule G? And the answer is no, it's waiting for F. Can we schedule D right away? Yes, it's connected to start. We're going to put D on the project timeline for the second worker. It is four units of time. One, two, three, four. Put a D in there. That's been scheduled. We go back to the beginning. Can we schedule task B? Well, no. D is done, but it's still waiting for A, so we can't do task uh, B yet. We skip over and we say, can we do G? No, G is still waiting for F. We skip and we say, can we do task A? And we say, yes, well, task A is connected to start. We can schedule that. D was four units. A is three. That brings us to seven. And we can say we've scheduled task A. And now we go back to the beginning and we say, can we schedule task B yet? B is waiting for A and D to complete. At the seventh unit of time, both A and D are complete. So we can schedule B. B is nine units. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. This is B, 9 plus 7 brings us to the 16th unit of time, and B has been scheduled. Next in our list is G. G is still waiting on F, so we skip it. After that, the next available task is C. C cannot begin until B is finished. So B doesn't finish till the 16th unit of time. We're looking for something to hand to work or two at the seventh unit of time. So we go on to, to F. F is two units. That brings us to ninth. Worker two is done and waiting for more work while worker one is still working on B. So we go back. We say, can we schedule G now? Well, G was waiting on F. We just finished F. So let's add G to the timeline. It's five units. One, two, three, four, five. Here's our G. 5 plus 9 brings us to 14. C cannot begin until B finishes. So this is going to be idle time here. Once task B finishes, we can schedule task C, 1, 2, 3 units. It doesn't matter if C is on the bottom or the top of this uh, for worker 1 or worker 2. I'm just being a nice boss, and since worker one hasn't had a break, I'm going to let them be able to take a break for the rest of the project. Now that we've done this, we see that the whole project takes 19 units of time, so the finish time is 19, and if we look at this, the idle time, we had three units of idle time for worker one, two units of idle time for worker two, 
So the idle time is equal to five. Now we're going to do this same exact project over, but this time we're going to use the critical time algorithm. Um, the critical time algorithm we're hoping will beat this finish time of 19 and be more efficient because critical time takes the chain of events into account. So here we have uh, our same graph. We have to now find the critical times for each vertex. So the end vertex has a critical time of zero. We'll use the backflow algorithm to find critical times for each vertex. I added zero to the two vertices connected to end. And then we continue to work backwards. I can add C, which has a critical time of three, to nine. Nine plus three gives B a critical time of 12. I can take the critical time of five on task G and add it to task F. So two plus five gives F a critical time of seven. And I see that task D has two arcs feeding back into it. So I need to choose which critical time do I add to task D. And we see I have to add the larger. So 12 plus four gives D a critical time of 16. 12 plus 3 on A gives A a critical time of 15. And E is 7 plus a critical time of 7, so that's 14. And now that we have all the critical times, we can make our priority list um, in order of decreasing critical times. The longest critical time is 16, so that's the project's fastest time that it can be done in. If you recall, I'm going to go back a slide, we did the project with 19 units of time using the decreasing time algorithm. Now, let's see if we can beat that. We see we have the potential to beat it because 16 tells us that uh, it could potentially complete the project in 16 units of time. That is the, the critical path from start to end. All right, so let's schedule these. Let's make our list. First task is D. Remember, we use the task time, not the critical time, when we're scheduling. So the priority list starts with a D4, then comes A3, E7, can't read that 3, All right, that's 16, 15, 14. Next comes 12, so B9. F2. You go down to the next line. Uh, G5. And C3. So the critical time algorithm tells us that we should schedule these tasks in this order to take into account the chain of events that slow down projects. So let's see how this goes. First is D. Can we schedule that right away? Yes, it's connected to start. And that's something else we should notice is that the vertices connected to start will have the largest critical times. So they will often be at the beginning of our priority list. So that means that we should usually be able to schedule our um, initial tasks in the list. So D takes four units of time, We're starting from zero, one, two, three, four. There's D. Cross that off the list. Let's do the schedule in blue. I have enough red ink here. Next task in the list is A. A is connected to start. It's three units of time. One, two, three. And cross A off the list. Next task in the list is E. That is also connected to start. So I can do that. As soon as A finishes, I can schedule E. It is seven units of time. Seven units plus three brings us to 10. Cross that off the list. Next is B. B is waiting for A and D to finish. 
Well, A and D are both finished at this time, so I can schedule B. B is nine units of time. Nine plus four is 13. Scheduled. Next in the list is F. F needs D and E to be complete. At the 10th unit of time, E completes and D completes back at four. So we say, yes, we can schedule F. It's only two units. So that brings us to 12. Cross it off the list. Next comes G. G is waiting for F. Well, we just finished F. That's five units of time. Five plus 12 is 17, off the list. C is waiting for B, B finished back at 13. One, two, three, that brings us to 16. And then one unit of idle time. And we see that the finish time here is 17. And the idle time is one unit. And we say, yes, we have completed the same exact project more efficiently and that is why um, project timelines are helpful in finding ways to avoid downtime with our workers or if we're talking about bigger projects um, if we have to rent a couple of cranes on a job site we don't want to rent them if they're not going to be used we don't want them sitting around idle uh, if we go back to the previous slide we saw that we had five units of downtime. You know, in terms of big projects, that could be five days, five weeks, five months. We don't want to incur those costs. So if we can bring the downtime um, down to one or to zero, we've made a very efficient schedule and we have less waste in our um, cost and time to complete the project. So that's the end of this presentation. Um, again, go back. Watch the video, read your notes, and do the homework practice. Check the answer key. Send me uh, questions if you have them. We can always meet in a video chat. And then I'm also uploading a quiz online based on critical time algorithms.